sweets. How are y'all doing tonight? Thank you, Brother Zach, for inviting me back, and thank you, church, for allowing me to come back. I wasn't sure, sitting, I kind of ran everywhere last time. I'm sure I didn't hurt y'all's neck last time, but uh, if you want to go and turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 19, that's where we're going to be tonight. This message, I was in central Missouri with um, a school I used to attend, a Christian school. I was in central Missouri for a um, competition where Christian schools from all over the globe who would come together and compete in fine arts like singing, speeches, athletics, all kind of stuff. And they would give us young men an opportunity to preach. Now, there would be 2,000 students there. We didn't get to speak to all 1,000 to all students, but they would have separate rooms where we could go in and other students could come in and listen. And so it was coming my time to go in the room, and I was got in there. Not anybody was in there except some other fellow pastors who had been there, and they kind of helped to assist us and kind of um, help guide us in ways to help us learn to preach. So I went in there. The only people that were in there were the people from my school. When I preached the message, they gave us a time limit of eight minutes because they didn't want us to be in there for hours and hours. But they gave us a time limit of eight minutes. And the thing I learned most in central Missouri, when there was no one in there to preach, only the pastors and the people from my school, there was a total of ten people, I was thinking, I just listened to a few other guys. There was 60, 90 people in there. I'm like, hey, they were able to impact 60 or 90 lives. That's awesome. That's, see, that was my mindset when I first started preaching. Oh, it needs to be a big group of people. But that day, after I uh, finished, one of the pastors said to me, he said, you know what, son? That was great. And even though there wasn't that many people in here, you still did a great job. And he said, I want you to remember this. It doesn't, amount, doesn't matter about how many people. It just matters that you preach the word. It doesn't matter if there's a hundred or just two. God's spirit can move in a hundred people. He can also move even mightier when there's only two people. And so this is, that's something I just wanted to share that I learned from this lesson. Now, you really don't find that in this chapter, Matthew chapter 19. Nowhere it talks about that. But that's how God moved in my life just from this sermon. So I'm going to go and read the passage. Then we'll pray. Then we're going to continue on with the points. And uh, starting in verse 16 of chapter 19, talking about the rich young ruler. It says, starting in verse 16, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this night, God, and Lord, thank you for this opportunity I have to come preach your word, God, and I pray to the Lord that you will hide me behind your cross tonight, God. So, dear Lord, that the, the words that come out of my mouth, God, that they are not my words, God, but your words, God. Let this Bible, let this word of God speak to lives, God, and let it speak to my life also, dear Lord. Not for, to, for my greatness, God, but so that I can become a better follower for you, God. Let the lives in here, God, be impacted tonight. Let hearts be broken then minted back in your love, God. Let conviction, God, come in this room. Let your spirit fill this room, God. Dear Lord, help our ears to listen, God, and our mind to focus, and our heart to apply the word that you have tonight, God. Dear Lord, we love you. Thank you for this time, and amen. Right here, if you start in verse, 10, uh, verse 16, you see where the, um, the rich young ruler came to Jesus. He said, good teacher. And now that's one of the titles for Jesus. He was a good teacher, but he was much, much more than that. And so he said, what should I have to do to gain eternal life? Now, we know that eternal life is gained through salvation. But if you look here, Jesus didn't go on that path in the conversation. 
He was saying, he was looking, he was saying more of works. Now, we all know works do not save. In the book of James, it says faith. But it says we show our faith by our works. So why, why would Jesus go on this path about works? Well, Jesus being all-knowing, since he is part, he, he's part of the Trinity, part he's God, he knew that this man struggled with thinking, oh, I just have to do works. He said, there's one work I haven't finished. Because Jesus starts naming off part of the Ten Commandments. And honestly, I think that some of these commandments he uh, laid out here, I think there were some of the ones that that rich young ruler struggled with. So Jesus, he went here on the talking about works to see if this man understood that he had a sin problem. That's which we all have, right? We all have a problem. Sometimes we're too scared to deal with it. So when he had this sin problem, Jesus was trying to expose that to him. But the rich young ruler, because of his pride, he didn't want to admit that. So the title of the message today is, When We Come to God. What do we do? What are we supposed to do when we come to God? First point I want to make here is that we have to come to God on His terms. See, as Jesus was talking, it took works. As, we, as I kind of elaborate on that for a little bit, we're going to talk about it more later on when I get to the second point. But it's not our works that save us. So, we fit in. We know that they're supposed to be a part of our life. But they're not a necessity to salvation. So once we get saved, that's when we have to start putting works into our life. Now, another way that works do not save us, just to prove to you if anyone is curious why works do not save us, save us because what I consider a good work that might save me, Brother Zach right here might not consider that to be a good work for salvation. He may say that's a good work, like holding the door open for somebody. I think, okay, if you hold the door open for people, that will get you into heaven. Brother Zach... He may not think that. So when people say, oh, I get to heaven by my works, well, what's the standard? If we want to use the work, what's the standard for that? So when people try to use that, you can use that against them saying, works, um, what's the standard? What do you consider good works? Because I consider maybe doing other things as good works, but you may not consider that as good enough. Um, this past semester... I had a, in my engineering class, I had um, one of my friends, he uh, came from uh, India. He was Hindu. And so um, we got to talking. He was telling me about his religion, and I was telling him about Christianity. And he had the mindset of that it was about works. He, he, had the, uh, he thinks, and he was trying to become a Christian, but he's saying, okay, if I read the Bible, if I pray, if I do these other things, Christian, right? And this was the hardest thing to, or him, I'm not sure if I didn't under, explain it well enough, or he was having a hard time understanding, but it, it's not works. It's putting your faith in Jesus Christ. It's doing more than just believing, because the Bible says that even the demons believe in Jesus. Even the demons believe in Jesus. We have to do more than that. We have to put our faith in Christ. We have to put our, give our life to him. So when we come to God, we have to come on His terms. What are some of God's terms? And when I'm talking about terms here, I'm kind of specifically talking about salvation. I'm not here to doubt, make you doubt your salvation. But I believe salvation needs to be preached from the pulpit repeatedly. Because when I was growing up, I was in church my whole life. I went to a Christian school. I went to a Christian daycare Christian family, I thought I was saved. Grew up in life, tried to be the best kid, tried to act good. Everyone around me thought I was such a good kid. But I did struggle with lying. I did struggle with cheating. Here's something some churches don't preach about. is um, As a young teenager, I struggle with pornography. I struggle with lust. Some people are scared to talk about that. But it's a truth that needs to be spoken from the pulpit. It's a problem. But I struggled with that sin. I, try, I, I hit it. I hit it very well. That's not a good thing to brag about, but I hit it very well. <laughs> but I wasn't a Christian. I read the Bible. I prayed. I did all the good works, but I wasn't a Christian. It wasn't until I heard a pastor ask a question one day at a um, weekend youth, or, 
weekend youth conference at my church, he asked this question. If you were to die tonight and you were standing at the gates of heaven, and God asked you, why should I let you into my Well, God, I went to a Christian school. That doesn't do it. You're not good enough because you did that. Well, God, I prayed. That's not good enough. Sorry. I read the Bible. Nope, that's not good enough. I came from a Christian family. That's not good enough, Noah. You have to put your faith in me. You have to believe in me. You have to give me your whole life. Not part of it. Your whole life. First thing on God's terms, we have to acknowledge Christ as our Savior. It says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6, And all, that key word, all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Proverbs known for the book of wisdom we could probably ever get. Um, my Sunday school teacher, I picked this up from him. He's saying he... He has heard from a lot of teenagers, he said a lot of people, they recognize Christ as Lord, but many of them don't recognize Christ as their Savior. There's two different words, two different names for Jesus, but they have two different meanings. We talk about Christ as being our Lord. We talk Him as being our King, as our guide, as our commander. But a Savior is something completely, completely different. When we acknowledge Christ as our Savior, we recognize that He went to the cross, cross for our sins. Yes. Not just the sins of just cheating or lying, but He took on the sins of adulterers, of murderers. Yes. Have you ever thought about that? He took, upon, he took upon Himself that pain that the murderers and adulterers had, the child molesters. That pain they experience, that guilt they have in their life, Jesus took that pain. You know why he took that pain? Because he loves everybody over here, he loves everybody over here, and he loves everybody over here. Right. Second thing we have to acknowledge, or another verse to share with you, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, it says, For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. Now, when I read that verse, I was thinking he's the Savior of all men. So is everybody going to heaven? No. Let's break that verse down just a little bit, that second part, where it says he is the Savior of all men. Even those who are not saved are still blessed. Because once we have sinned, we deserve death. We deserve hell. We deserve pain. We don't deserve anything good. We don't deserve anything righteous. But you know, even but all the time, even the people who go through that sin and they're not Christians, they're not following Christ, they still get blessings. Right. That's because, and that's where it says God is the Savior of all men. He does grant a few blessings on them. But there's the second part. It says He is especially of He's the Savior of especially of those who believe. See, it's not, it's not saying that we're still not going to go through trials like those, like the non-Christians, but God is especially the Savior for us as we walk down the Christian life. God is especially our Savior. He is always with us. He's not going to abandon us. To acknowledge Christ as our Savior and our Lord, then we have to acknowledge ourselves as a sinner. A few summers ago, I traveled with an evangelist. His name was Rick Lane, and we went to Jacksonville for a whole summer. And he did a bunch of street ministry. He went to a bunch of camps, and I was with him. And he taught me a lot of things on evangelism and sharing the gospel with people. He taught me this one thing. If you, when you're sharing the gospel with one thing, the first thing you've got to do is show the person that they're lost. And that's what Jesus was trying to do right here. Am I correct? He was trying to show the rich young ruler that he had a sin problem. As we all do. In Psalm verse 3 it says, For I acknowledge, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Sometimes we may to try to hide our sin so people don't see it in our lives. We'll hide it over here. But then when people actually see us, they think we're a good person. But you see, God just doesn't see the front side of us. 
He sees the backside when we have sin hidden over there and hidden over here. And the people around us, they think, oh, they're a good person. They're a good person. Jesus sees the truth in our lives. He just doesn't see the outer side as we all do. We can look good for seven years. Everyone thought I was a good kid, but I wasn't saved. How many could that be your testimony tonight? Been in church your whole life, but you're not saved. You haven't given your life to Christ. It's truth that is scary, but it's truth that needs to be spoken. A quote by Adrian Rogers said, Are the things you're living for worth Jesus dying for. I wish I could come up with quick, uh, great quotes like that. Are the things you're living for right now, think, just think back on your life right now. Compare the good things you've done for Christ. Compare how you've tried to live for Christ. Then compare the things that you have just completely disobeyed Christ. Are the things you're living for worth Jesus dying for? We experience sin every day. It's around us all. All the time. We walk out the doors of the church, they're there. We walk out of our homes, they're there. We walk in our homes, they're there. We walk in our schools, we go to work. Sin is all around. Just kind of a quick comparison here. Um, radiation. Sounds scary when we think about it because we think it's, it's very dangerous, and it is. But did you know we experience radiation every day from the sun? If we go to the doctor's office and we have x-rays, we experience radi radiation there. We experience radiation sometimes through our food. We experience radiation just about everywhere, every day. But it's not enough to kill us or hurt us. But too much of it will. We experience sin every day, wherever we go. A little bit doesn't seem to kill us. It's bad for us, but that sin, if you have just a little bit and you don't do nothing about it, it's just going to keep building up and building up and building up. And guess what? The next deep down in sin. Too much radiation kills us. What will too much sin do to us? Well, the Bible says just one sin, which we are born with sin, because uh, sin is um, passed down from father to son, father to son, father to son. And because of that sin is passed down, once we're born into this earth, because of sin, we are condemned to hell. That's some more truth that... Um, uh, my youth pastor was showing me the other day a preacher. He was scared to even talk about that in his sermon. He was scared to talk about hell. He was scared to talk about sin. Well, guess what? We don't need to be scared to talk about sin because if people do not understand that they have a sin problem, not change. People keep thinking, keep thinking, oh, I'm good, I'm fine. Wait, you're not because we have a sin problem, people. I'm not scared to shout about sin. But you know what else? I'm not scared to shout about Jesus. Because he is the answer to sin. Jesus isn't just the person we go to in times of trouble. But he is the person we go to in time at any time. And guess what? Sin is a big, big problem. I know I keep repeating myself on that. But I learned through repetition. I don't know about you, but I learned through doing stuff multiple and multiple times. And understanding that I have a sin problem, that we have a sin problem, and if we do nothing about it, we're in trouble. We're in a lot of trouble. Quote, uh, two quotes by Billy Graham. He said, the original sin was and still is the human's choice. The human's choice to be one's own God. Ever since the beginning of time and with Adam and Eve. They wanted to be their own God. Own God. That's what Satan deceived them into believing that if they ate of that fruit, they could become like God. Their own God. They didn't need him. They could just cast him away. <laughs> I don't think it's that easy. A second quote. And I love this one. I've, I've, I've used it. He said, we have two choices in this life. We can bow down to the things of this world. We can have the pleasures of this world and die spiritually. We'll bow down to the true God and live with Him in eternity. So many times we just see the beginning point. 
That's all we see. We see the beginning point. So right now on this earth, if we see the beginning point or just the little area, that little area at the start, we look at the sin and we think, oh, sin's not that bad. It's actually fun to play with. And it is. Sin is fun. Sin's fun. It's fun until you get to the end. Wait, you're still having a good time? Oh, that sin, that one's a little bad. I want to take a different sin path. So I go down here. Oh, that one's, that one's a little scary. Let me try another one. Then we get to the end of the sin path and we realize that good time we had back up there, it's pointless because that was fun. But you know what? The, at the end of the sin path, hell. Let's, let's go over here and try the, um, the life of the Christian path. So we're going down the Christian path, and we look at the start, and we see there's some trials. But i got to believe in God all the time. i got to show Christ in my life. So we try, and we go through trials. We may trip up. We may stumble. But you know what's at the end? Heaven. And that's what Billy Graham was saying in this quote. It's that so many times we look at the beginning... And one seems good, one seems a little like a struggle. But we have to look at the end. We have to look at the finish line. Because that's where we're going to spend eternity is the finish line. The second point. We have to acknowledge Christ as our Savior and ourself as a sinner. And we have to ask for forgiveness. Jesus says, or in the book of John, chapter 14, 14, it says, If you ask anything my, in my name, I will do it. Ephesians 1, 7, it says, And him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness according to the riches of his grace. The definition of grace is just, if you're wanting, is getting something we don't deserve. And in Acts 17, 30, it says, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. So I believe forgiveness, it's more than just that. Forgiveness is a step further of going to repentance. And repentance, in a, just kind of an example here, is going from one direction and completely turning around. So it's going from that life of sin and completely turning around to Christ, completely forgetting that sin and leaving it behind. See, one of the greatest gifts that we were given is the chance to repent, I believe. The de- angels who fell, the demons, they weren't given a chance to repent. But we were. And so we have to take that gift. We have to take that opportunity and move forward. We can't stay where we're at. We have to take that opportunity of repentance and move forward. The third thing is we have to accept his gift of salvation. In the book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I've already alleged because of sin, we deserve, there's two deaths because of sin. A physical death, which we all would get, that's when our body dies, but the spiritual death is when we spend eternity in hell. But there's a way out of that. And that's the second part of this second part of this verse says, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are not saved by the plan of salvation, but by the man of salvation. And that is Jesus, church. Some of the things y'all probably already knew about salvation. You're thinking, I've heard that hundreds and hundreds of times. But here's my second point, point. it's my final point. After salvation, our life, it's supposed to be transformed. The book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 2, it's a very popular verse. It says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Uh, another quote by Adrian Rogers says, we ought, to live, we ought to be living as if Jesus died yesterday, rose again this morning and is coming back this afternoon. Because you know what? Jesus could come back this afternoon. So we're living this, so if you're living this life of sin and you agree that Jesus this afternoon, we've got to get it right. Because the Bible does not tell us no man knows when Jesus is coming back. It could be this next minute, this next second, this next hour. It could be 
after another decade. But we don't know. And so that's why we have to prepare right now. We can't wait. We can't just lollygag around. But we have to act right now. And the transformed life, it takes the Bible outside the walls and takes it outside of the church. And a transformed life, it's a combination of works and faith. And I'm going to turn to uh, James here. If y'all would like to turn there too, just to double what James has to say. I'm reading a few verses through here. Starting in verse 17, it says, Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. That's a good thing. That's what James was saying. You're doing a good job. But guess what? Even the demons believe. That's what I was talking about earlier. Even the demons believe in Jesus, and they tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, what faith without works or that faith without works is dead. Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar. And do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith has, was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Because Abraham showed his faith by his works, it was accounted to him righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Verse 24 says, You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. It's more than just faith, church. And I know a lot of this seems very repetitive, and I apologize for that. But I'm trying to help you understand that it's more than just doing the good things in life. It is works, but it's also faith. Another, another verse I want to share with you is Titus chapter 1, verse 16. It says, They prophesied to know God, but in works they deny Him being abominable and disobedient and disqualified for every good work. And there has to be a balance of faith and works. We have to give our complete faith to Jesus, but then there has to be a balance of putting works in, understanding that those works do nothing for the sake of eternal life, but what those works do, that they glorify God. So church, I'm about to close out, but there was one thing I said, a transformed life, and that's what I want to focus on now, a transformed life takes the Bible outside the walls of the church. I think so many times, and I know I've done this before, I get such in the routine of coming into church. I come in, I have my Bible, and I have my notebook, and I have my pen, and I sit down, I hear the preacher, we sing, then we hear the preacher, we pray, then I get up and leave. But that's not it. That's not what the Christian life is, is just coming to church, bringing your Bible, taking notes, or highlighting your Bible, whatever you do. But it is bringing your Bible, it is all that stuff, but it's doing much much more is when you take this Bible and you take the notes you have written down, you study it, you apply it to your life. You know what you do, church? You come to these doors right here. We open them up. And we take this Bible outside the walls. I know most preachers don't get up and move around like I do, but I try to be different. This Bible is not to meant, this Bible is not meant to stay in the church. This is not its home in the world, sharing it with other people. And it may not be physically taking this Bible, but it may be putting it in our minds, memorizing it, and taking it to others, and sharing the gospel with others. Are we scared to do that? Is that something we should be scared to do? I'm fired up now, church, so we're not, I thought it was about to close, but never mind. <laughs> the Bible, this is not the home for the Bible. A lot of people think this is like, a church is like a hospital. Where people just come in, they get repaired, then they leave. That's not what church is. Church is where you come in, you get the word of God, but then you take it right back out of there. So this is like where you go shopping, you buy your supplies, you build up on your supplies, then you head back out there. Amen. So let's not...
keep the Bible confined. Let's not keep this word confined in a box, confined in a building. Because guess what? This word wants to expand. God's glory wants to expand. It's, it's like he, God's compared to light. You know what light wants to do? Keep going and going and going. That's what it wants to do. Keep going and going and going. And that's what God's glory, that's what God's grace, that's what God's love wants to do. It keeps wants to go and go and go and go. It doesn't want to stop. You know, the only things that get in the way of that, this is sad to say, but God's glory shining, it's us. So often, it's us that gets in the way. That's when we have to humble ourselves. We have to come to the altar and say, God, I've messed up. I need you right now. I don't know what to do, God. I have this problem, God. I have this sin problem. And I need to get it right. So, dear Lord, Lord, will you be with me right now to help me in every situation I go through? Dear Lord, I don't have the strength to do it alone, God. Men have tried to do it alone in the past. In fact, people tried to build a tower so tall that they could get to heaven. Tried to build a tower so tall that they could get to heaven. But guess what? It doesn't work that way. And you know what? Because of that sin they had to try to get to heaven their own way, God dispersed them all over the nation with different languages. Well, people think, well, if that's not going to get us to heaven, maybe going to church, doing good works, maybe that will get us to heaven, right? That's not it either, church. Going, going to church is a good thing. Doing good works, that's a good thing. People may have thought, well... We have airplanes now. We have rockets. We can go to outer space. Anyway, hasn't happened yet, and it won't happen. No church, there's only one way to heaven. I'm glad I saved my notes on my computer because I just ripped these up. You know what, church? One way to heaven. It's the cross. That's the way. And there's more to the illustration. Stumbling blocks, they may get in the way to becoming more like Christ. Stumbling blocks may come in the way, but you know what? When Jesus, they're nothing. Jesus throws them out of the way. They're nothing in the sight of God. Oh, that stumbling block gets in the way? Don't worry. God's like, I got you covered. So, church, now I'm about to continue to close. And um, <laughs> maybe I might change my mind again. But um, I just want you to be thinking right now and reflecting on that question I asked at the beginning that the pastor asked me when I got, before I got saved. And I want to ask you that question, church. If you were to die right now and you were standing at the gates of heaven and God asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? What would you say, church? If you want to go and bow your head and close your eyes, do something a little different. We all have a choice to make in this life. If there's anyone here tonight to say, you know what, Noah? I'm not a Christian. I've been faking it, and I need to get it right. I've been doubting it for a while. I've been wondering if I'm even saved. I'm not going to call you. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. But I just want to know if you would simply raise your hand and say, Noah, I am not saved. And I need to get it right tonight. If there's anyone in this room that is willing to say that, Dear Lord, I don't know why I should be letting you get it right. I see that hand. And I'm going to be here after the service. And if you want to come talk to me or Pastor Zach and get that right tonight, let's get it done. Because there's a day coming when it's too late. I'm going to pray, then Brother Zach can come up here and take care of the rest. But um, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for y'all. And um, if there's anyone else that is still unsure if they are saved or not, come forward. Come forward. Dear Lord, I want to thank you for this night. Thank you for Brother Zach, God, and thank you for this church, dear Lord. Thank you for your spirit moving in this place, God. Dear Lord, it's not about 
ourselves, God, but it's, Lord, it's about your spirit. It's not about amount of, about amount of, amount of people. It's not about who's in here, God. But it matters that your spirit is in here, God, and that we have worshipped you tonight, God. And Lord, our hearts have been opened and lives, the Lord, have been challenged. And I pray that they will take that challenge, God, and apply it to life, God. And Lord, instead of conforming to the world, God, be transformed and conformed to you. Dear Lord, help us today, dear Lord, throughout this day, God, to serve you and to love you more, God. Dear Lord, not for our sake, but for the sake of the kingdom of God. That lives will be changed for you, God. And let this Bible not stay chained up, God. Let it not be bought in these walls, God. But it be taken out, dear Lord, so that it can change our lives and change others' lives. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. Dear Lord, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen.